This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Legend has it that off the coast of Northern California, divers have glimpsed the remains of a sunken World War II submarine. But is there more to the story than mere legend? Several Navy veterans remember sinking a sub near San Francisco in 1945, and now they fear it might have been one of our own. In Oklahoma, abject poverty forced a couple, along with their six children, to set up housekeeping in an old school bus. When that meager shelter was taken away, Leela and Roy Lee Stallings were arrested, and the children were separated. Perhaps someone watching can help reunite the school bus family. And the strange saga of John and Linda Sotis. In 1985, the young couple left their home in a well-to-do Los Angeles suburb for a two-week trip to New York. They never returned. Then this past spring, workmen installing a pool at their former residence were stunned by the discovery of a dismembered human skeleton. Almost overnight, an inactive missing persons case became an intriguing murder mystery. Join me for these intriguing new stories and more on another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. May 1994, San Marino, California, just north of Los Angeles. Excavation for a backyard swimming pool came to an abrupt halt when workmen made a grim discovery. Three plastic bags and a fiberglass box containing dismembered sections of a human skeleton. We didn't really know who this person was, and we were later told by uniformed officers from San Marino that in 1985, the people that lived in that house had reported two people missing. The two missing persons were John Sohas and his wife, Linda, both in their late 20s. Their sudden disappearance had mystified everyone who knew them. The grisly discovery was a macabre twist in a nearly 10-year-old mystery. It suddenly appeared that either John or Linda Sohas may have been the victim of foul play. Detectives probing the disappearance encountered a cast of characters that might have been dreamed up by a mystery writer. Though married for two years, John and Linda still lived with John's mother, Dee Dee Sohas, by all accounts an alcoholic. However, the most intriguing character would prove to be a mysterious young man who went by the name Christopher Chichester. For about two years, Chichester was a tenant in a guest house in the Sohas property, located behind the main house occupied by Dee Dee, John, and Linda. Hi, honey. According to friends, John and Linda felt trapped living with Dee Dee Sohas and looked forward to escaping to a place of their own. That looks great. John held several part-time computer programming jobs and Linda was beginning to find success as an artist. Linda was happy with her life, and John approved of everything she had to do and say about life and what she wanted to do and be in life, and I thought that was great for her because she'd never had a supportive man in her life. Early in 1985, it appeared the young couple had finally gotten the break they'd been hoping for. Linda announced that she and John had been asked to interview for important new jobs. Linda called me and informed me that John had a job 
with the government, and she couldn't release any information to me. All she could tell me was that he's got a job with the government, and they want us both, and we have to go to New York. Linda told Sue that the trip was scheduled to last about two weeks. However, the return day came and went. No Linda and John. The mystery would deepen in the coming months. I've been begun for about two weeks. Can I cover it? Prior to the trip, Linda had boarded her six cats at a local kennel and paid in advance for a two-week stay. But at the end of eight weeks, she still had not claimed her pets. The kennel owner tracked down Linda's sister, Kathy. Be good, I'll miss you. I immediately thought that something was wrong. If they were not going to return, they would have taken their pets with them. I feel that inside very strongly that Linda would not have left her animals behind. Kathy telephoned John's mother, Dee Dee Sohas, hoping she had an explanation. Hello. Dee Dee, it's Kathy, Linda's sister. Is Linda back from her trip yet? I'm not supposed to tell you anything. Tell me what? Oh, what can't you tell me? The mission. Mission? What, what mission? What are you talking about? It was very frustrating in all my conversations with Mrs. Sohas to get the same stories, slightly altered, but still the same story about Linda and John being on a secret mission and unable to contact any family members. Well, that's all I can tell you. So it did appear to me as though she had been drinking. Sometimes it depended on what time of the day you called as to how wild the story became. April, 1985. Responding to a missing persons report filed by Linda's family, San Marino police tried their hand at getting information from Dee Dee Sohas. Report on John and Linda Sohas. Do you know where they are? They're not missing. Everybody keeps asking me, and I keep telling them they're on a secret mission. OK. Can you tell us how we can reach them? I have a source. Everyone keeps calling here, and I keep telling them. Dee Dee refused to identify the person she called her source. With no evidence of foul play, the authorities were powerless to investigate further. Finally, a full three months after the Sohuses had supposedly left, Linda's friend Sue received this picture postcard. But it had not been mailed from New York. Far from it. I have no clue as to how going to New York could ever wind up being France. And I read the back of it. I was just like, I can't wait. She's finally going to tell me where she is, what's going on. And all it said was, Dear Sue, kind of missed New York. Oops. But this can be lived with. John and Linda. Nothing about, I'll call you later, can't talk now. Nothing. It just didn't sound like her. Another card was sent from France to Linda's family. My mother received a postcard from Linda, I believe it to be from Linda. It did not say when she would return or how she had come to be in Paris. If they were planning a trip to Europe, she would have been very excited about going and would certainly have expressed that to my mother and perhaps myself as well. When I first talked to the police, I thought I knew what was going on, but now... Three months after refusing to help the police, Dee Dee Sokas had an inexplicable change of heart. She, too, found a missing persons report on John and Linda. Have you had any contact at all since they left? Well, I've been sending their mail through my source. The man has been in contact with them. He's been the one telling me what's been happening. We'll need to talk to this individual. You can't. That's why I'm worried. He's gone, too, just disappeared. According to Dee Dee, the mysterious contact was none other than her guest house tenant, Christopher Chichester. However, he had recently moved, leaving no forwarding address. Dee Dee also reported that her son's pickup truck was now missing, though she could not say when it had disappeared. However, there still was no proof that a crime had been committed, and the investigation stalled. If I think of anything else, I'll call you. Soon after finding her missing person report, Dee Dee Sohus would sell her house and move to a trailer park. She died in February of 1988, the fate of her son still a mystery. 
Nine months later, the case unexpectedly sprang to life. The Sohus's truck turned up 3,000 miles away in Greenwich, Connecticut. A man calling himself Christopher Crow had tried to sell the pickup to the son of a local minister. Well, this is it. That's a great looking truck. Yeah, I told you you'd like it. Uh, one thing, though, I, I don't have the title paper, so you're going to have to get them from the California DMV. The Reverend's son decided not to purchase the vehicle based on the fact that there was an outstanding lien on the truck. The San Marino Police Department wanted me to also look for an individual by the name of Christopher Chichester, who they felt had information on the whereabouts of John and Linda Soas. My uh, continued investigation and in attempting to locate Mr. Chichester ultimately ended in me discovering that Mr. Chichester and Mr. Crow were the same individuals. It was a stunning discovery. Crow, Chichester, by any name, the enigmatic ex-tenant seemed to be one person who might be able to shed light on the Sohus's disappearance. But Christopher Crow, alias Christopher Chichester, had vanished again. Consequently, the investigation stalled again until the dismembered skeleton was uncovered in May of 1994. After extensive analysis, a forensic anthropologist determined that the remains were consistent with physical descriptions of John Sohus. However, a lack of dental records prevented conclusive identification. Police could only speculate about how the body came to be buried in the backyard of the one-time Sohus residence. Nothing about the bones themselves that say there was murder. There was no bullet holes, anything like that. But the fact that the bones were buried in three separate plastic bags and the head in a separate, pla in a, in a separate bag makes one think that the, there was murder involved. Detectives hope to learn more in using a controversial chemical called luminol. Though it is highly toxic and dangerous to use, luminol will emit a distinctive glow when it comes into contact with blood, even where the stains were wiped away years before. Luminol was applied to the cement floors in the guest house on the former Sohus property. Within moments, it would become apparent if there was evidence of murder. The telltale glow was unmistakable. Cat, what do you think about that? Looks like it could be blood. A whole lot of blood, Ron. Although luminol can detect chemicals in other compounds, this was not just a trace element situation. The, there was a copious amount of something put on that floor, and in our opinion, that was blood. But whose blood? Was John Sohus murdered in the guest house and buried in the backyard? If so, what happened to Linda? Officially, both John and Linda Sohus are still missing, perhaps having the time of their lives gallivanting across Europe. I believe that it would have been possible for John and Linda to relocate and have a new life and choose not to contact family members, but I do believe that after so many years have passed, that at some point, at least once, Linda would have made contact. There is one curious footnote to this perplexing case. According to the kennel operator, in June of 1985, a woman showed up and asked for Linda's cats. Faced with the alternative of destroying the animals, a kennel owner complied. She never saw the woman again, and there is no clue to her identity or whether she has any connection to the case. Authorities would like to speak to the young man known as Christopher Chichester, they now know that he is Christian Gerhard Streiter, a native of Germany. Next, a mystery submarine sunk during World War II. Could it have been one of our own, attacked mistakenly?
The 840-mile coastline of California is a treasure trove of natural beauty. Its long stretches of beach, coupled with fabulous rock formations, have made it a haven for deep-sea divers. Over the years, a kind of beach town urban legend has sprung up along the coast. Rumor has it that divers between Santa Barbara and San Francisco have sighted something very unusual. We're about uh, 15 miles off the point. I'm out in a six pack. We're down about 120 feet. Uh -huh. Now listen, I got real good visibility, maybe 30 or 40 feet. Really? And sitting off the point there at the bottom, right on the reef, is what I think a World War II submarine, a U-boat. A submarine? Yeah. Out here? Yes. Deck guns, the whole thing in place, right there at the reef. Crystal clear. Today, it seems preposterous. An enemy sub that close to the continental United States. But in World War II, America's coastline was vulnerable to enemy sub attack. A German U-boat was sighted off the coast of New England in May of 1945. Later that year, an oil rig near Santa Barbara, California, was fired upon by a Japanese submarine. Despite the obvious threat that existed 50 years ago, the rumors of a sunken sub remain just that, rumors. But in fact, there are a few aging American sailors who remember a submarine hit in 1945, just off the coast of Northern California. At the time, of course, he assumed it was the enemy, but curiously, no record of the incident exists. Now the old sailors are afraid they might inadvertently have sunk one of our own. During 1944 and 1945, the USS Willard Keith was one of a fleet of Navy destroyers patrolling the Pacific coast. For the most part, life on board was all practice and drill with the K-guns, better known as depth charges. Then came March 21st, 1945. The Willard Keith was cruising south of San Francisco when a general quarters alarm sounded. An enemy sub was below. Chet Gardner was a 19-year-old seaman on the Willard Keith. His duty set the depth of the explosive charges. Well, I can see it just plain today as I could the day that it happened. Starboard cake, I'm ready to fire, sir. It's something I'll never forget because I was probably pretty excited about it. Boy, the water flew everywhere. So I thought, my gosh, we've made a mistake. Uh, it looked to me like we were going to blow the ship right out of the water that was so shallow. But uh, as we watched then, uh, word came down from the bridge that uh, they had got a hit. Something coming up. There's, there's oil coming up. It was a tremendous explosion, you know. And... Eugene Sheridan, and then 24 said, years old, manned a K-gun on the Willard and Keith. We see the uh, all greenish-looking, oilish-looking stuff coming to the top of the water, and it's not uh, seawater. You're in there all the time. You can tell the difference of color of it. And, and we made three or four passes around and back and forth and crisscrossed and everything else, and we never did pick it up again. After we had made our turn and came back, uh, they couldn't pick it up on the sonar anymore. There was no more sound. Uh, we assume it was just laying on the bottom there some place. Bill Anderson, a laundryman on the main deck, was just 18 years old. Even then, Bill had his doubts and began to wonder whether, in fact, the sunken submarine did belong to the enemy. Indeed, Bill felt strongly enough to question a junior officer. Because we're too close to shore, Anderson. But, sir, it's if it was an American submarine, it'd be on the surface, not below it. Yes, sir. It was kind of a sobering thought, you know. I mean, you had maybe 50, 60 men dying below you at that time, or we thought this was the case. Bill Anderson has never been able to shake that haunting image, nor the nagging suspicion that the dying men were his own comrades. He has petitioned the Navy and received the deck log and war diary for the Willard Keith, but there is no record of the submarine hit. Uh, the war diary we got 
doesn't mention any enemy contact, doesn't mention this depth charge run whatsoever. There didn't seem to be any information in Washington on a submarine being sunk off the coast of California. In 1992, Bill Anderson and a partner pooled their resources and bought a boat called the Echo Hunter. Using radar, underwater sonar, and divers, they are determined to find the sunken submarine. Just make a circle on that, Wayne. We think the odds are good enough that we've spent most of our money on this project to, to find it. Uh, it. It's became an obsession with us to, <laughs> to, find, the, uh, to find the sub. I say it like we either sunk it right there or we crippled it bad and it crawled off someplace else. Maybe, maybe got away or maybe who knows, you know. But I definitely do know that, the, that we dropped the depth charges on it. The Navy denies that it happened, but it did happen. Why they say it didn't happen, I don't know, unless they're covering it up, you know, unless it is one of our subs. And, and they don't want it known. Did the USS Willard Keith make a direct hit that day in 1945? If so, regardless of whether the dead are American, Japanese, or German, the Willard Keith sailors hope to turn the sunken submarine into a monument to honor the memory of those who fought and those who died. At our request, the U.S. Navy checked their archives. They gave us the following statement. We have no record of the USS Willard Keith sinking a submarine in the spring of 1945. Additionally, we have no record of any sub sinkings in the Eastern Pacific Ocean during that same time frame. Bill Anderson and his comrades remain undaunted. They plan to continue their quest. Next, the mysterious death of a Cook County, Illinois police captain. Was it suicide or was it a contract killing? According to those who knew him best, Captain Michael O'Mara of the Cook County, Illinois Sheriff's Police was the straightest of straight arrows. He was a devoted husband and father the only officer in the sheriff's police trained at the FBI Academy. In the 60s, O'Mara became celebrated as a scourge of the Illinois Mafia. By 1988, however, Michael O'Mara had been relegated to a desk job in the records department. It should have been the gentle twilight of a brilliant career. Should have been, but wasn't. May 30th, 1988 shortly after 9 p.m. At the Cook County Courthouse, a sheriff's police patrolman pulled into the private service area to gas up his car. An unmarked police car was parked at the pumps with a gas nozzle in the tank, yet no officer was in sight. As the patrolman's flashlight played over the lawn around the service area, he Whoa. caught a glimpse of a gruesome scene. Michael O'Mara's body was slumped over a rock in the middle of the lawn. He had been shot once through the head. His wallet and his briefcase had not been touched. Even though there was no sign of a robbery, Michael O'Mara's reputation as a crusader against organized crime made murder seem a distinct possibility. Just north of the Markham Courthouse pumps, requesting the You approach a death scene as uh, possibly a homicide initially, that, uh, you know, uh, who did this? There was a gun uh, to the uh, right side of the, uh, of the body, near the right hand, and uh, there was a very visible gunshot wound to the uh, forehead. There was a flashlight found next to a rock that uh, that we can uh, identify as, as his flashlight. Uh, the gun is his gun. And there was one, one bullet that uh, was discharged uh, from 
that cylinder of that weapon. You've got nothing in any way, shape, or form to say that there was anybody else there. The victim's uh, pockets were intact, uh, his, his money was intact, his car was intact. If you were going to weigh this, there, there would be more, there would be more, uh, more weight towards a, a suicide or an accident than there would be towards, towards a murder. Two weeks after Mike O'Mara died, a Cook County coroner handed down a ruling which confirmed investigators' suspicions. The official cause of death was listed as suicide. It all seemed so final. A tragic end to an otherwise spotless career. But it was not the end. Mike O'Mara's friends and family felt there'd been a rush to judgment. Despite the coroner's ruling, they were convinced that Mike had been murdered. What they didn't know was who could have done it and why. But they were sure that Michael O'Mara had not killed himself. The last person known to have seen Mike alive was his wife, Barbara. She recalls he left the house that night in good spirits, saying he had to fill his department vehicle with gas. Right before he left, he said he was going to stop on the way back to get yogurt, and he asked everybody what, what flavor they wanted. And uh, of course, it was the day before payday, and he didn't have any money in his wallet, so he asked me for some money to go. Barbara, do you have any cash? Uh, yeah, my purse is in the hallway on the table. Thanks. Why would... You know, he'd take my last couple of dollars to get the yogurt if he was planning on not coming back. It doesn't make any sense. In this case, you can take any isolated fact and say it can be consistent with suicide. The problem is, is the whole scenario, when you look at that, is not that of a suicide. In 1989, Barbara O'Mara hired Dr. DeMaio to review the case, including the coroner's findings and the events leading up to Mike O'Mara's death. When I uh, reviewed the uh, background information in this case, uh, it was evident that there was no reason yeah. for the individual to have committed suicide. There was no financial problems, no personal problems, no fatal disease. Uh, that does not completely rule out suicide, but it kind of makes the uh, conclusion that a death is suicide uh, a little more difficult. The man is found dead in a field with a flashlight next to him and his gun. His car is parked nearby with the gasoline nozzle inserted into the tank. This does not sound like a suicide, you know, unless the man just drove up there and as he was uh, filling his gas tank, says, hey, gee, I don't have anything else to do. Might as well commit suicide. It was kind of bizarre. Based on his investigation, Dr. DeMaio has come up with a scenario for murder. The evidence of the scene suggests that Mr. O'Mara began to fill the tank of uh, his car when he saw or heard something in the field. He then took a gun from his briefcase and went to investigate. When he got into the field, he met somebody or a number of people, and he was shot. I think that if someone was screaming that a crime was occurring and he was standing right at his vehicle, I don't know why he wouldn't ask for help first. Also, it's my understanding from reading the file and talking to the investigators that persons who heard a shot fired did not hear those other things. They didn't hear somebody calling for help. Uh, when our investigators went to the scene and they looked in the field, it didn't appear that there was any struggle in the field, if not by him and somebody else, by that, quote, a fa possible offender and a third party. There was no evidence of, of a struggle. Who would have had a motive to kill Mike O'Mara? Could it have been a long forgotten enemy nursing a vendetta for more than 25 years, ever since O'Mara and his raiders went after the mafia in the 60s? Or could Mike O'Mara have had an enemy closer to home, perhaps even in the sheriff's police? If anyone knows, he's not saying. But Dr. DeMaio points to one additional fact which he believes argues against suicide. When people uh, shoot themselves, they tend to put the gun firmly against the head at the time of discharge. 
In this case, the muzzle of the weapon was between two and four inches away from the skin. And you could see that by the powder tattooing uh, on the skin around the entrance wound. Uh, he may have chosen to have it not be a contact wound because he did, he taught homicide investigation. I mean, he, he taught courses and he, he taught about suicide. So he knows if he wanted to make it look like something other than it was, he may have deliberately done that. Well, I don't think you can really get into someone's head when they're, when they're uh, if, if they are about to go and, and do something as drastic as this. Uh, he, uh, he left the house uh, with the intent to get gas. He told his wife that and going to bring some uh, frozen yogurt home. Uh, so he, uh, he played that scenario out. Yeah, he just didn't come home. Based on the information that I have in front of me uh, in, in reading the entire case, it tends to be suicide. I don't have any evidence in front of me that would conclude that this was a homicide and, we need, and we're looking for the offenders. What happened to Captain Michael O'Mara on the night of May 30th, 1988? Is it possible he chose to end his own life? A life which would have been the envy of any police officer? Or is there a killer still at large, still unidentified, still a danger? Mike O'Mara's friends and family believe the answer is obvious. Mike O'Mara was not a man to commit suicide. One of the reasons that I don't believe this would have been a suicide, it just wouldn't have been his nature to do something like this, either to his family or to his religious beliefs. It wasn't an accident, he was purposely shot, and uh, why it's being covered up or whether they know or anybody knows, I don't know. I can't believe it's a suicide at all. Knowing Mike, uh, it was totally foreign to his nature. He uh, was never one to give up on something. It, you know, it just doesn't fit him. You know, what happened out there, I'll never know, but Suicide, I'll never believe. On the evening of October 2nd, 1961, Mr. and Mrs. Earl Betcher and their son, Alan, were leaving Baptist Hospital in Jacksonville, Florida. When Alan ran ahead to the family car, he made a startling discovery a baby girl had been carefully placed in the back seat. The child became a local celebrity. Newspapers dubbed her Baby Girl X. Within a year, she was adopted by Mary Lou and William Christie of Tallahassee and named Terry. Terry grew up happily, doted on by her parents and an older brother and sister. By the time she was a teenager, however, she began to ask questions. I kind of rebelled and wanted to know. And that's when we went to the library and looked it up, and then I got excited. I was proud, you know. Together, Terry and her adoptive mother, Mary Lou, searched for clues to the identity of Terry's birth mother. Let's, let's roll it some more see what else we see. I believe she had a heart. She put me somewhere safe where I was going to be well taken care of, and I appreciate that. I just want to meet her and see how she is. I would like to find a beginning. Did you, did you see anybody around? No. Okay, okay. Thanks to our broadcast, Terry Christie Derby now knows the answers to all of her questions. Sadly, Terry's birth mother, Edith Campbell, died on August 17th, 1993, just a few months before our segment aired. But out of this sadness, a happy ending did emerge. Terry was delighted to learn that she had a sister and three brothers. They were delighted as well. None of them had ever known that Terry existed. On July 8, 1994, Terry went to a hotel in Miami, Florida to meet three of her siblings, Philip, Paul, and Cecilia, face to face for the first time. It was the neatest experience of my life. I walked in and there was everybody I wanted to see. Next to me giving birth to my own kids, this is 
the best thing that's ever happened to me. Best thing. My, my experience is that there's more of the, you know, just a biological thing in a family. There's also a, a karmic, um, a, a sense of underlying uh, destiny that lies underneath the whole thing. And this, you know, you meet somebody, I meet Terry, and it's like, she is my sister. I knew it right away, you know? There's no doubt. At the reunion, Terry and her adoptive mother finally saw a picture of Terry's biological mother, Edith Campbell, According to a family member, Edith had given Terry up only because of extreme financial desperation. Knowing what a, what a loving person she was, uh, she cared about nothing but her children her whole life. And um, I can only imagine the anguish that, that she went through uh, when she decided to do this. Hi, I'm George They make me feel wanted. They make me feel... Like, I'm not an outcast, like, I kind of felt like I was, you know, in the past, but I, I, I can feel their um, vibes, love, whatever, you know. It's kind of cool. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Come on. The next day, Terry met her other brother, Chris, who had been called out of town on business on the day of the reunion. That's right, snuggle up, brothers and sister. At last, the family circle is complete. When we return, perhaps you can help reunite a family torn apart by poverty and misunderstanding. In the year 1948, a family tragedy began to unfold just north of Tipton, Oklahoma. You coming home after work today? Roy Lee and Leela Stallings, along with their six children, existed on the edge of abject poverty. The Stallings actually lived in an old school bus. Roy Lee worked sporadically as a sharecropper and was rarely at home. He gambled away what little money he brought in. In his own way, he was fatherly by trying to make a living for us. But as far as being home, he wasn't home that much. The mother was the one that was a disciplinarian to cooking the food and supplying the meals and everything. It was mother's job. In spite of almost insurmountable odds, Leela Stalling struggled to maintain a home life that was as normal as possible. Mary, why don't you take me Thank you. Here we, go. we always had something to do. And we had toys to play with and each other to play with. So it, we don't, we didn't think of ourselves as being different. Do you want to hear the story of Noah's Ark again? Yeah. OK. One day, the Lord told Noah to build an ark. And he Mother couldn't read nor write, but her Bible meant a lot to her. And she'd see pictures, and she'd tell us Bible stories from the pictures. And we grew up with a very uh, direct sense of what was right and wrong. And to the children, the old school bus was home, a haven and a safe place. But others, notably Melvin Purdy, a family friend, had different ideas. And Melvin did not hesitate to make his feelings known to Leela Stallings. Melvin, you want to separate our family? Leela, you, you don't have a prayer over in that old bus with him. Melvin, kids. I will see you dead before you get my Leela, kids. Leela, that's no way for you to act now. I want you to leave and never Never come back here. You're not gonna let me take little David Ray. No, right? you can't have him. Well, I'm gonna tell you something. I think you ain't gonna have any of them kids very long. The only child Melvin wanted to raise himself was four-year-old David Ray, the youngest boy. But Melvin thought all the children were neglected. From the baby, two-year-old Norma Ruth, to the eldest, 12-year-old Roy Jr. Mary was then 10, the oldest girl and second mother to the younger ones. Joe was both big brother and role model to six-year-old Ernest Lee. The bus is gone. 
The final straw came a few weeks later when the old school bus was taken away. Apparently, Roy Lee Stallings had lost it in a poker game. Melvin Purdy, along with several others, wasted no time contacting the authorities. State of Oklahoma versus Lee and Leela Stallings. You've been charged with the crime of omitting to provide for the care of minor children. How do you plead to these charges? Not guilty. Based on evidence presented to this court, there is due cause to have you bound over for trial. Until further decision, the children are placed in the care of the Child Welfare Department under your supervision. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. and Mrs. Stallings, at this time, you are placed in the custody of the Tillman County Sheriff's Department. I remember seeing them both in handcuffs. And that was the last time I saw Mother as they led her out the side door. And that was something very strange to us. Over the next few days, the Stallings children would all be taken to foster homes. Mary vividly remembers the last time she saw her three youngest siblings. I put Ernest Lee in the car, told Ernest to get in the car, and I put David in the car. And they, Normie was holding on to me and wouldn't let go, and they pulled her out of my arms and put her in the car. You go in the house. Ernest Lee was pulling at the window. They had rolled the windows up. And that's the last time I saw them. Within a week, the charges against Leela and Roy Lee Stallings were dropped, but the damage had already been done. Leela was told that all of her children, except the oldest, Roy Jr., had been put up for adoption. Two years later, after Roy Lee and Leela divorced, Mary was allowed to go home and live with her mother. Joe was reunited with them in 1959. Leela passed away in 1989. But Mary and Joe still desperately want to be reunited with their brothers and sisters. We've never given up hope that they are, are still alive and that we will be able to find them. Curious as to what they've grown up like, their family life, what, what they've made of themselves, and definitely hoping that I, if I do find them, that none of this will ever hurt them. I have tried every avenue that I have came before me to try and locate these brothers and sisters. And I'll never quit until the last day of my life. Unsolved mysteries appeared to be the last hope. And happily, the day after our broadcast, 35 years of frustration came to an end for Joe and Mary. A man named Lee Shulian of Owasso, Oklahoma, called our phone center. He identified himself as Ernest Lee Stallings, who was only five when the family was split apart. Lee was thrilled to hear that his brother and sister were looking for him and was anxious to meet them. Morning. Hi, thank you. Three weeks later, Lee arrived at a hotel in Tulsa, Oklahoma to be reunited with Joe. Hello. The two brothers had not seen each other in nearly half a century. I've been talking to you on the phone quite a bit. I've waited for this moment for so many years. No, I know, that's what I heard. I don't even know how to describe it. <laughs> it's such a wonderful feeling. Oh, it's about time. It's, it's definitely time for this. <laughs> Walking in this morning, he walked in, and we met, hugged each other. Nobody can realize the feeling. We just separated too many years. Yeah, about 40, 46. Yeah, 47, so. I really didn't know how I was going to react. Uh, you know, we've been separated 46 years. And I felt a lot better than what I thought I might. And I was really, you know, felt real good to, to hug him. We've already started making uh, some plans. 
to get together and go fishing. <laughs> so we got a future ahead of us to uh, be together and enjoy each other. Victor, here is you and I. Sadly, Joe and Lee's sister Mary was unable to attend the reunion. However, she has spoken with Lee on the phone, and they plan to get together in the very near future. My dad. Right, yeah. On our next Unsolved Mysteries, a remarkable story of faith and healing. When Vera Marie Calandra was two years old, her parents were told that she had just weeks to live. Vera Marie's mother immediately undertook an arduous journey to Italy to ask for a special blessing from an aging priest named Padre Pio. Within weeks, doctors were stunned to find that Vera Marie was well on her way to recovery. Today, Vera Marie Calandra is a normal, healthy adult was she saved by a miracle? Join me next Friday for this uplifting story and much more on Unsolved Mysteries.